newsletter. He's written extensively for journals and newspapers in Australia and overseas. He's the author of various books, including Reasoning Things Out and The Natural Economy. And he's taught at the Centre for, for Domestic Studies. I've read some of John's work. I've always been struck by the easy style and the lucidity of his expression. So thank you, John, for that. You've made easy work what could have been hard. <laughs> His John's uh, address today is on Father Brown, the detective who philosophised. I have a particular affinity with this title because it's through Father Brown that I first knew of G.K. Chesterton. And one of my treasured possessions is the book with the whole 49 Father Brown stories, which was given to me by my parents when I was 14 or 15. So I've had that book about 20 years. <laughs> Well, in this talk, I want to consider Chesterton as a philosopher who used his literary gifts to express deep philosophical concepts. Can you later, speak in the microphone? Later, um, later on, I'll give examples, particularly from the Father Brown stories, but maybe a while we, before we get around to Father Brown. Um, Chesterton, of course, has had enormous influence on so many people, uh, and there are many uh, explanations, reasons for that. His unique literary style is one. He's, he had very wide interests, he had massive common sense, he had a profound understanding of reality, and he was a good man, a holy man. But he's not usually regarded as a philosopher. Yet I believe that he was not just a philosopher, but a uh, metaphysician. Uh, his book on St. Thomas Aquinas, the eminent philosopher Etienne Gilson, said this about him, I consider it to be, without possible comparison, the best book ever written on St. Thomas. Chesterton was one of the deepest thinkers who ever existed. Now those words from Gilson are quoted by Cyril Clemens in his book, Chesterton. Well, and so was Chesterton a philosopher. He himself says that he was not a trained philosopher, acquainted with the technique of the trade. That's in his book, St. Thomas Aquinas. I believe, though, that he is to be seen as a philosopher and indeed as a metaphysician. And we can approach that by considering what is philosophy. Now, philosophy is the study of reality at the, its deepest level by the use of human reason. So a person who, whose reason penetrates deeply <coughs> into reality is a philosopher. Whether he has academic qualifications is not relevant. He may have impressive university degrees in philosophy, yet not be a philosopher. In fact, the students enrolled in philosophy courses at some of the most prestigious universities are likely to end up with less philosophical insight than when they began the course. <laughs> um, years ago, ago, I remember I was at a, um, an open day at Sydney University, and then I think uh, Vice uh, Chancellor uh, Professor Herman Black gave a little talk. And he said that um, the, uh, the um, aim that we should have, a student should have in um, engaging in a, a philosophy course, or, or a university course, a student should question every proposition, including that one. <laughs> and what you find at the universities is that they put up all sorts of <coughs> theories and what they can thought and uh, what Hegel thought and so on, but they don't give the uh, basic principles that are needed in order to uh, solve them with the uh, questions. So the student may end up uh, less of a philosopher at the end of his course than he was at the beginning. Um, now, uh, uh, philosophy as um, 
as um, traditionally understood, is the uh, examination of the ultimate questions that human reason can um, deal with apart from divine revelation. And the most profound part of philosophy is called metaphysics. It deals with being at, at its deepest level, a level deeper than anything that can be attained by our five senses. So it deals with the supreme principle, principles that underlie all our thinking, even though we may not be explicitly aware of these underlying principles. It deals with the transcendentals of truth, goodness and beauty, which are attributes of all things, from the most primitive subatomic particle to God himself. In its mo most profound subdivision, natural theology, it deals with the existence and nature of God, so far as it can be known by reason, as distinct, distinct from divine revelation. In that regard, by the way, the Catholic Church teaches infallibly that the existence of God can be proved by reason. And you find some of the Catholics, particularly those who have had university studies, uh, who are um, disconcerted by that uh, proposition. They've, they've been um, taught that you can't prove God. You may have some um, evidence of it, his existence, but you can't be sure. But as the Catholic Church says, you, it, it can be proved with certainty from reason. Catholic had one in 1870 um, um, put forward that uh, infallible teaching. Now, some people have little inclination to, for thinking at this deep level. Um, and one reason for that is the secular reason that pervades our society. But a deeper reason comes from na na the nature of man and the nature of human thought. Now, each of us is a complex of the body and soul. And the soul is not material, but spiritual. Yet it does not operate independently, but always in conjunction with the body. And our knowledge begins with the five senses, sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. Now, I don't know whether there's ever been a case where a child was conceived and born so defective that it had none of the senses. We know of uh, those who've been bl born blind or, or deaf. But suppose that a, a child was, was born with none of the senses, it couldn't, it was blind, it was deaf, uh, it, it had no sense of touch or of taste or of smell. Now that child would be unconscious all its life. It could never know anything because all their knowledge come, comes through those five senses. And so it is if a person is born blind, they have no proper understanding of colour, because colour can be reached only by that one sense, the sense of sight. And I mention this to illustrate the importance of the senses, the five senses, in regard to our higher knowledges. What happens is that the five senses convey knowledge to the internal senses of imagination and memory, and the intellect abstracts an understanding of reality from what the senses present to it. But it's an abstract knowledge. The senses themselves don't get beyond the surface of things. We abstract the meaning from those um, surface, um, that surface knowledge. So, take the lower animals, say a horse or a, a, a dog, their senses may be as keen as ours, their five senses, but they have no intellectual knowledge whatever because they have not got a spiritual soul and therefore have not got an intellect. But we abstract uh, from our senses uh, a, a higher kind of knowledge. Now, this means that our intellectual knowledge has a certain remoteness about it. It, it lacks the concrete character of the sense knowledge from which it has been abstracted. Yet it is far more important than the sense impressions from which it, from which it is derived. 
And intellectual knowledge is not just a higher degree of sense knowledge, but is different in kind, not just in degree. For it reveals the very nature of things, whereas sense knowledge is confined to the external, to the appearances of things, and does not penetrate into their natures. Uh, so St. Thomas says um, that sight knows this coloured thing, but intellect knows the very nature of colour. But things are not just a bundle of sensible qualities. A potato, for example, is not just qualities that can be seen and felt and tasted. It's, it's a substance having these qualities. Yet the substance, the, the essential reality, can't be reached by any of our senses. But it can be known by the intellect, which abstracts the nature of the thing from the sensible qualities presented to the five senses. But because our intellectual knowledge of things is abstracted from what the, the external senses perceive, <coughs> there's a remoteness about it in contrast with the concrete apprehensions of the senses. So we can tend to think things are more real because more concrete in our apprehension, whereas it, it, it is really the intellect that penetrates most deeply into things, and sense knows them only superficially. We can illustrate this by the notion of substance, that we know something of what the thing is. The, the, the inner reality of the thing is the substance, and we can get some knowledge of it um, by abstract intellectual knowledge. Um, Uh, the uh, 18th century uh, British philosopher George Berkeley couldn't make a, a, a head or tail of the notion of substance. He saw that there's some unknown something that is supposed to underlie all our word sense knowledge. And he said, well, uh, uh, what's the point of it then? So he denied that there was any such thing as substance. So he was left with um, the sensible appearances, colours and shapes and so on, but no underlying substance. And his conclusion was that material things don't exist. Oh. <coughs> um, he believed there are only spirits. There's the supreme spirit who is God, and uh, ourselves, we are finite spirits. And what happens is that God puts sensations into, into us. So, for example, you're not hit really here. I'm not here either. Um, but uh, God has put into my... Um, mind, my spirit, an appearance of all of you here in the seats and so on. And likewise, you uh, think you can see me, but um, it's only an appearance put into you by God. Um, and that is one um, possible um, conclusion, if you deny the reality of substance. But substances are the, <laughs> the, the most real things. Um, the tree out there, for example, if we could see, if we could get beyond the senses and penetrate into the very nature of the tree, it would be fascinating. It would be far uh, more fascinating than any sense knowledge we have. We'd see uh, uh, the, the nature of the thing and the qualities flowing from it, but we can't. We only have, everything comes to us through the senses, and therefore uh, our intellectual knowledge is has a certain remoteness about it, even though it's about the most important things. Now, and now we come to Chesterton's um, outlook here. Now, Jacques Maritain, the great French philosopher, in the most profound of his works, The Degrees of Knowledge, contrasts the approach of the metaphysician with that of the artist. He says, the metaphysician breathes an atmosphere of abstraction which is death for the artist. The imagination, the discontinuous, the unverifiable, in which the metaphysician perishes, is life itself to the artist. While both absorb rays that come down from the creative night, the artist finds nourishment in a bound intelligibility and the metaphysician finds it in a naked intelligibility. So there's this uh, contrast and the, the artist sees sensible reality and in that sensible reality he 
understands things. But the metaphysician uh, abstracts from what the senses show. His knowledge is abstract, the knowledge of the artist is concrete. And a fascinating thing about Chesterton, and an essential key to understand his influence, is his ability to combine both approaches. His thought is metaphysical because it penetrates into the depths of being. But he expresses it with vivid imagery in the manner of an artist. Uh, we see another example of that, by the way, in St. Thomas Aquinas' Eucharistic hymns. They're very concrete, and yet they show profound penetration into the natures of things. Uh, so, if, if to come back to Chesterton, he often speaks of the awareness and wonder of being which the young child has, and that's how this tends to become dimmer as the child grows older. Uh, to quote Chesterton, when we're very young children, we do not need fairy tales. We only need tales. Real life is interesting enough. A child of seven is excited by being told that Tommy opened a door and saw a dragon. But the child of three is excited by being told that Tommy opened a door. <laughs> and that's in orthodoxy. And, but Chesterton, unlike many of us, never lost his sense of wonder. He never lost it because he always retained a deep insight into the meaning of being. So he was a metaphysician before he ever studied metaphysics. He saw that there cannot be a pure flux, for example, a pure become, that beneath all becoming there is being, and contingent being, that is dependent being, leads us to the perfect being who is God. Now, this comes out particularly well in his book, St. Thomas Aquinas the book that um, Gilson so highly praised. Uh, Jake Maritain also praised that book very highly. So Chesterton saw the basic principles and he was able to apply them to the ever-changing world around him. But it was the principles that were basic, not the changes. So in one of the Father Brown stories, there's a conversation between Father Brown and a sceptical-minded doctor it goes like this. The doctor says, I'm a practical man. I don't bother much about philosophy or theology. And Father Brown replies, you won't be a practical man until you do. <laughs> um, now, Chester, of course, uses paradoxes to get his meaning across. Um, uh, take... Um, the question of overpopulation and these people who say that um, we um, need less people in the world because um, overpopulation causes poverty and so forth. Um, the way Chesterton um, deals with that, he says, suppose there are ten boys and they have only nine hats. Now the right um, solution is to manufacture another hat. But the solution of the population controllers is to cut off all of the heads. Yeah. And he, he can, things that we would express in a more sort of prosaic way, he has a striking way of, um, of getting them across. And it's because his uh, imagination, his senses were working in conjunction with a deep intellect. Um, and then there are his paradoxes like. Uh, his comment that travel narrows the mind. And it does only issue of both. So if you, if you haven't been to a certain country, say you haven't been to the United States, States um, you'll have a general sort of knowledge of it. But when you actually go there, it becomes more concrete. So your knowledge has been narrowed, not widened. Uh, or again, the, the famous one in orthodoxy, that the madman is the man who has lost everything except his reason. And some people reading that thought Chesterton was being anti-intellectual. So they didn't have much understanding of what he was saying. Um, then the, the book um, by H.G. Wells, God the Invisible King, 
I haven't read the book, but I understand it gives a very anthropomorphic notion of God. And that's probably the criticism um, some people would make, because Mr. Wells' God is very anthropomorphic. But the way Chester puts it is, Mr. Wells, Mr. Wells' Invisible King seems very like Mr. Wells' Invisible Man. <laughs> so he had this way of uh, getting a, a message across the, in a, a vivid fashion. Uh, Monsignor Randall Knox said that he was prepared to defend any of Chesterton's paradoxes. Um, I don't know what he would have done about this uh, statement when uh, the, the uh, idea that, Chester, that Shakespeare didn't write the plays attributed to him because he didn't have the background and he didn't have the education. And one um, uh, uh, alleged fact that was given in support of this is at one stage, Chesterton, it said, he said, had a job holding the horses of uh, wealthy people when they came in their carriages. Well, a man like that, well, how could he write the place? Uh, Chesterton's comment is, and if it is true that Chesterton held horses, it's because he was by, by far the, the safest man to hold them. Uh, and there's, uh, there's a, a meaning in that. It, it's... Um, it's He's showing that um, uh, uh, whether, Chest whether um, Shakespeare could have written the plays or not will depend on the qualities of the man rather than whether he had a certain background. Um, now, um, I'm coming to Father Brown and um, say something about uh, the way that... Um, Chesterton gets his message across there. And remember, behind all this is the fact that Chesterton had this deep penetration into reality, but which he could express in a vivid way, because he also had an intense, um, sensible way. He, could, he had both things. Anyway, um, he... he Uh, I um, wrote an article for the American paper The Wanderer on Father Brown and um, I flicked through the um, Father Brown stories looking for, uh, for um, illustrations of um, the message that Chesterton uh, put through, uh, gets through in, these, um, in this fiction. And I'm surprised really that how many messages he, he does... Um, Uh, bring to the to the mind of his readers. And yet he doesn't seem to be preaching, he's just <coughs> um, So Chesterton was keenly interested in the detect detective story. In fact he created more than one detective. He created I think 13 detectives. They worked in twos and threes sometimes. Uh, there's a book by uh, edited by Murray Smith called 13 Detectives and she gives them um, Um, a number of these um, Chesterton stories. Anyway, um, Chesterton was first president of the Detection Club. It was formed in 1930 and he remained president until his death in 1936. Dorothy, Elt Dorothy L. Sayers was among the other enthusiastic members. They were all taken lightheartedly with a mock solemnity. Uh, so Chesterton in his Father Brown story The Mirror of the Magistrate, as the detective officer James Bagshaw said, ours is the only trade where the professional is always supposed to be wrong. After all, people don't write stories in which hairdressers can't cut hair and have to be helped by a customer, or in which a cab man can't drive a cab until his fare explains to him the philosophy of cab driving. It's only detective stories you get that. He started with the very first um, um, detective story in the modern sense, The Murders in the Rue Morgue by Edgar Allan Poe, published about eight years before. In that story, the, the uh, police um, arrest the wrong man and the amateur uh, solves the mystery. And that's been the way ever since with detective stories. Um, now, um, Father Brown's method is quite different from that of, say, Sherlock Holmes. 
take, for example, a passage from the Conan Doyle story, The Lost Gun Valley Mystery. In that story, a young man has been accused of murdering his father. And the family agreed to be innocent, calling this inspector the stride of, of Scotland Yard. And uh, he does his best to um, clear the young man, but he, 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 goes, he, he finds it to be quite hopeless. And so the family, in desperation, call in Sherlock Holmes. And Holmes goes over the scene of the crime and um, complains about how the clues have been disturbed in the meantime. And he finishes up by saying, the murder, he, murderer, um, quote, is a tall man, left-handed, leaps with the right leg, wears thick-soled shooting boots and a grey cloak, smokes Indian cigars, uses a cigar holder, and carries a blunt pen knife in his pocket. That's the way Sherlock Holmes proceeded. Uh, but uh, Father Brown doesn't do that sort of thing. His approach is psychological. Um, and often, Father Brown imagined himself as doing the thing that the uh, criminal did. And this, I think, brings out uh, this bit I'm going to read, Chesterton's um, humility and his uh, awareness of human weaknesses. So Father Brown says, no, man, no man's really any good till he knows how bad he is or might be till he's realised exactly how much right he has to all this snobbery and sneering and talking about criminals as if they were apes in a forest 10,000 miles away, till his only hope is somewhere or other to have captured one criminal and kept him safe and sane under his own hat. Uh, that need for humility, humility, and for seeing ourselves as we are, is shown in a number of the Father Brown stories. For example, in the, the story, The Man in the Passage, um, each witness saw a man he assumed to be the killer. But they differed in their descriptions, except each one was unfavourably impressed by what he saw. So one witness described the man as a brute with huge humped shoulders like a chimpanzee and bristles sticking out of its head like a pig. And the only witness who recognised the figure was Father Brown. And he recognised it as himself. Because each witness had been looking in the mirror, each one had seen himself. But he didn't know himself as he was. And so gave a wrong description. And um, the judge asked Father Brown how he could um, know his own figure in the looking glass when two such distinguished men had not recognised themselves. Uh, Father Brown replied that he didn't know. And, quote, unless it's because I look at it, uh, because I don't look at it so often. And we can apply to Father Brown the words of St. Paul about God choosing the foolish things of the world to, 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 to confound the wise. Uh, so Father Brown is described in this way here. A face is round and as dull as a Norfolk dumpling he had eyes as empty as the North Sea. He had several brown paper parcels which he was quite incapable of collecting. And seeing him, the unbelieving French detective, Bonneton, reflected that doubt with the Eucharistic, Eucharistic Congress to which the Prince was going had, quote, sucked out of their local stagnation many such creatures, blind and helpless, like moles disinterred. And that, that uh, is a theme that um, Chester deals with in the Father Brown stories, the, um, uh, the fact that the, the Christian, or the priest, is seen as part of the human, but in fact he has a greater intelligence than the people who criticise him. Um, and many of the stories stress the validity and indispensability of human reason. So in the blue, the blue Cross, I think that's the first of the Father Brown stories, just as it says the expression, a thinking machine, is, quote, a brainless phrase of modern fatalism and materialism. A machine only is a machine because it cannot think. And that's true. Uh, uh, 
just as understood the nature of human knowledge. And anyone who understands that should see straight away that there cannot be, could not possibly be any such thing as a machine that can think. But yet even some um, people who should know better wonder whether someday will there be a thinking machine. But we're not, we're not, we haven't got time to go into the um, question of the nature of human knowledge any more than we have just done. Um, uh, again, the, the uh, master criminal Flambeau, before his conversion, betrayed himself when disguised as a priest. He suggested that there may be other universes where, quote, reason is utterly unreasonable. And that statement made Father Brown sure that Flambeau was not a priest. And later on, after Flambeau had been exposed, he asked Father Brown, how did you know? How did you know I was not a priest? And Father Brown gave a couple of reasons, and one was, you, ta you attacked the reason, expand theology. <laughs> uh, today, that um, test wouldn't be so certain. Um, in his notion of, um, his, if you are intellectuals, or so-called intellectuals, uh, there's a character in The Scandal of Father Brown, he, uh, of whom Father Brown says, uh, she, hasn't got any, she hasn't got any intellect to speak of, but you don't need any intellect to be an intellectual. <laughs> and then, of course, there's Professor de Worms in The um, in, uh, Mountains Thursday, who um, uh, was believed by his followers to be a great intellectual, and then he was confronted by um, a young actor, and uh, the professor tried to um, to put the, the um, young actor down and show himself to be the true professor by making statements that no one in the room but himself could understand. But the actor went one better. He made statements he couldn't even understand himself, which convinced the professor's um, followers that the actor must be the true professor. <laughs> Um, uh, then in the Father Brown story, the red moon of Meru, uh, Miru, Lady Monteagle, who is attracted, uh, attracted to East Eastern religions, says to Father Brown, surely you must understand that all religions are really the same. Father Brown replies that if they are, quote, it seems rather unnecessary to, to go into the middle of Asia to get one. <laughs> uh, in many of the stories, hypocrisy is exposed. So, uh, for example, in the story of the chief mourner of Mali, in that story, a man had uh, killed an opponent in a duel many years before and were filled with remorse at having done so. And uh, Father Brown treats it as a serious matter. He killed the man. But the others in the story, other people in the story, think Father Brown is uh, too harsh. They said, well, a hundred years earlier, a duel would have been legal. And um, it turns out what actually happened was that um, the man who won the duel had done it by a trick. He had actually murdered his opponent. He had thrown himself down as though he had been shot. And then when the, his opponent came up to him and um, uh, 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 said that he had um, apparently killed the man or, or hurt him, uh, full of remorse. The man on the ground um, pointed his revolver at the other man, shot him dead deliberately. So that is, is what had really happened. And when these people in the story heard what really happened, their attitude changed completely. Um, so one called him a filthy viper, another said he should be lynched, and Father Brown was the only one who would forgive him. Uh, Father Brown believed the murderer should be forgiven, for he had shown deep remorse. And answering the others, Father Brown said this, You must forgive me if I am not altogether crushed by your constant 
tend to for my uncharitable witness today, or by the lectures you read me about pardon for every sinner. Well, it seems to me that you only pardon the sins that you don't really think sinful. So you tolerate a conventional duel, just as you tolerate a, a conventional divorce. You forgive because there isn't anything to be forgiven. Now, Father Brown, at times, is assumed to be superstitious because he's a Catholic priest and he believes in the supernatural. But it turns out on those occasions that it is the secularists who are the superstitious ones. And that comes out in the story, the Oracle, Oracle of, Do of the Dog, where um, a young man named Finnis interprets the behaviour of the murdered man's dog in a certain way, because the dog did a couple of um, things that could be interpreted in more than one way. After, uh, presumably he did not know that his master has been killed, but somehow he seemed to sense it. And so um, Finnis sees the behaviour of man's dog as pointing to him having, the dog having known that his son had just been killed, and then there's pointing to the murderer. And he suggests the dogs know a lot more than we do. Now, Father Brown takes the dog's behaviour seriously, but he interprets it very differently. Because whereas his friend implicitly asked himself, what do the dog's actions mean if the dog is an oracle? Father Brown asked himself, what do the dog's actions mean if the dog is a dog? And from the, exactly the same um, reactions of the dog, he got a quite different um, explanation. Um, so these detective stories show a rational universe where these, there is object of good and evil and where the humble, not the powerful or conventionally respectable, see the truth. But um, the thing that I think underlies this and just as it is genius is the fact that he had a deep penetration into reality, that he was a metaphysician, therefore. But he combined that with uh, the gifts of an artist. And so uh, where many metaphysicians would be uh, quite um, abstract and, and uh, hard to follow in their reasoning, uh, just as it can be concrete, and yet still penetrate into these metaphysical realities. Uh, I think I'll leave it there. We haven't got very much time and uh, we have some dead questions and discussion if, if there are any. Thank you very much, John. Um, we, we, have, uh, we have mass schedule for those who would like to attend at 5.30. Uh, we have a little bit of time uh, before that. Um, so, uh, are there any questions or comments, Matt? Uh, the Thomistic hymns on the Eucharist, was that the Adoro Te that you had in mind? Uh, that, that could find them, yes. yes. Um, you gave a lovely explanation of what a philosopher is um, at the very beginning, saying that they didn't need educating philosophy. Could you just repeat that? Um, yes, well, the philosophy is the deepest knowledge that human reason can reach uh, without the aid of divine revelation. So, whereas the scientist, for example, is uh, concerned what can be measured or, or, uh, or in other ways that, uh, um, apprehended through the senses, it doesn't go deep. The scientist doesn't go deeply into things. It's on the surface and he uses microscopes, so microscopes and telescopes and so on and uh, test tubes, but he's on that sense level, explaining things in terms of the sensible. Whereas the philosopher does this deeply into reality, as can be done. Um, so, for example, the philosopher, looking at the question of, of the existence of God, will look at evidences in the world. Uh, each one of St. Thomas's five ways of proving the existence of God begins with um, some fact evident to the senses. In the first way, for example, he says it is clear and evident to the senses that some things are in motion. Uh, what does things move about? 
And so with each of his five ways, he starts with some fact evident to our five senses. And then he goes on to apply principles to these facts. And that's the way that the philosopher proceeds. He, he looks at the common uh, sensible things that we all know, that we, where we know by our common sense, and which we, we can see and hear and so on, and, and applies unchangeable principles to those facts. And in that way penetrates deeply into reality. But the um, difficulty is that all, as I said, all our intellectual knowledge comes through our senses and is only reached by abstracting from the senses. And therefore, the, 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 our knowledge of the deepest things can seem very abstract and unreal, whereas in fact it's the most real knowledge. Yes, Could you comment on the phenomenon that so that two things that are related. One, the idea that the state is neutral. And second, that seems to be related to that, the idea that metaphysics is an option. Like, like one of the contemporary philosophers said that his theory is a political theory, not a metaphysical theory. So he had an idea that you could somehow have politics without metaphysics. As a philosopher, can you comment on why we've come to this kind of state where metaphysics is seen as optional? Uh, yeah, well, I think um, we can see the reason if we look at uh, the development of philosophy over the last 500 years in particular, and um, particularly in regard to empiricism. By empiricism, I mean the theory that not only that we get all our knowledge uh, through our senses, but that there's no deeper knowledge. Um, so Chesterton, in, uh, in his book on St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, says that um, for St. Thomas um, there's nothing in the intellect that was not first in the senses. Uh, now, he meant the right thing, but uh, that's a bad formulation. Uh, that is empiricism. If there's nothing in the intellect that was not first in the senses, we can't know anything supersensible. What St. Thomas actually said was that there's nothing in the intellect that did not have its beginning in the sense. So I think with uh, so many modern philosophy, philosophies, yet they, they don't get beyond the sense level, they don't penetrate deeply into things. Um, and, um, and this is um, aggravated by the fact that the physical sciences uh, do re remain on that level, they're concerned with the explanation of phenomena not going deeply into the metaphysical, metaphysical area. But because the, um, uh, the special sciences, astronomy and so on, medicine, have been so um, useful in recent times, they've done so well, that people tend to see, think, well, that's the best kind of knowledge. Um, but in fact, um, so it's a matter of um, the wrong philosophies, particularly empiricism, that have arisen in the last... Um, have become popular in the last few hundred years, uh, and the fact that the um, physical sciences um, have been so useful to us, and therefore the tendency is to remain on that level. Yes. Sean, first, and then Richard. Um, why do you think um, you've got all this knowledge, you've come from somewhere, <coughs> And then we dump the very truth that allowed us to arrive at where we are and take advantage of all that abundance and bounty. And, I mean, what is it in the human psyche that, that sort of, you know, just avails itself of dumping them? It's something that was very pertinent yeah. at the foundation level. Yeah. But as we draw away from that, Yes, yeah, so I think um, uh, that's partly answered by a comment that Aristotle made that what is at the beginning a small error becomes a big one in the end. So what happens if uh, somebody makes what looks like a minor mistake uh, um, and uh, then it develops that as time passes and maybe centuries pass, the implications of it are drawn out. It's as if I was to... Um, to try and uh, put these fingers um, um, at an equal distance from each other and uh, level with each other. No. They may look level, but if I was to, could extend them out for 
a mile or something. They might deviate. So it's like, like that with um, uh, a mistake that looks all right. It doesn't look like a mistake. But then, in time, the implications are drawn out. And this applies particularly in philosophy because the philosophers try to um, go as, well, as fully into things as they can. They take principles and draw them out. What I said about Berkeley earlier, um, he had no real notion of substance, so he got rid of it. He was left with just spirits and God putting ideas into us. Um, so what happens is then that uh, the philosopher, if he goes wrong, it will, it will very likely go very wrong. And there is the fact that um, philosophy is difficult. Uh, and um, so um, we can't, can't get all sorts of, um, of serious errors. And one thing leads to another. Um, I read somewhere in some chemistry book that when Einstein some of the you know, quantum mechanics and that couldn't see it. The maths and everything proved what was going on. And then when, when he sort of found out what was going on, he, he attributed to um, God not... Uh, uh, this wasn't a mistake. And um, uh, God did not make the universe by mistake. So he, he, he humbled himself before the truth. But... He couldn't see it. Now, why can't mainstream science, what, or why aren't people being told of blokes like that to, to bridge the, 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 the greater knowledge gap that's needed to bring us back to the total truth? Yes. Well, I think uh, once wrong ideas take over in a society, it's very difficult. And the way the universities are now, well, uh, and uh, so... Um, uh, Jack Maritain in his book, An Introduction to Philosophy, has a chapter called Philosophy and Common Sense. Now, he doesn't believe that philosophy is based on common sense because philosophy has to go more deeply, but he says if we find that a philosophy we're studying goes against common sense, that should be a warning to us. That uh, philosophy, while it goes far deeper than common <coughs> sense, is not um, contrary to it. And that was something, of course, that Chesterton knew very well. He was a man of very deep common sense. Richard, did you ever, we might find, make this the final question? Thank this you. Is, this is mainly yeah. tongue in cheek, maybe. Yeah. Okay. You'd all laugh afterwards, which I hope you will. One of my priest friends said to me, Why would I go to uni? To get dumber. So, I think um, there's some people that might agree with me. Not in, as practical as my wife. But the point is, I'm just sort of, it's that might be a good comment to sort of finish with the philosopher. Because, you know, when Descartes says, I am, but I am, um, I'd like your explanation of that philosophy. So I'll just leave that with you both. Uh, yes, well, uh, the way the university is hard today, most of the universities, uh, a student can easily lose his faith if he studies philosophy. Um, so Dr. Austin Woodbury at the Aquinas Academy said that um, a student who studied philosophy at Sydney University but did not counter that by going to the Aquinas Academy, uh, if he knew what he was doing, he would be still guilty of mortal sin. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, just to bring the conference to a close, could I mention a number of things? Firstly, um, we have developed through the kindness and particularly the skill of uh, one of our sons at, at Chesterton, uh, Australian Chesterton website, and that's the, um, the address, and um, it has on it uh, currently earlier issues of the defendant that we had here in paper form today, um, last year's papers in both video form as well as in, in uh, text form, and uh, uh, our aim would be to, uh, to put today's papers available 
uh, on uh, on the website in due course when uh, we can gather them together, both uh, the video uh, production that Michael has kindly uh, made today, as well as the um, the, the text uh, version uh, in paper form. So. Um, those, of, those of you who are already members of the Society will uh, see the announcements about this and the Defendant. Uh, those of you that may not have um, uh, become members, uh, I'd, um, I'd certainly invite you to consider that possibility uh, and uh, make, make contact uh, with me if you'd like to, to join and, uh, and receive the Defendant. Uh, the second thing is that I've, um, uh, I'm very increasingly conscious of what an international movement uh, Chesterton represents, which is a great reflection of his physical generosity. Uh, that he's a he's a global he's a global man, and uh, one of the things I did just want to um, uh, uh, just read out very briefly is this morning I got a message from uh, certainly the most active. Uh, Chesterton Society, the American Chesterton Society, uh, which its annual conference is, uh, would attract 500 people in different cities of America. Um, and this was from Dale Orquist, the president of the American Chesterton Society, and he just said, please convey my greetings to the members of the other ACS uh, at your conference uh, tomorrow, where it may already be today, which was true. Thank you for sharing in the great work of exposing a very sad and insane world to the joy and sanity of G.K. Chesterton. I hope one day I may join you again down under, uh, your servant Dale Alquist. Uh, we invited Dale out some years ago. He addressed uh, uh, one of our conferences in Melbourne, and uh, it's still uh, a hope that we have. I know he is keen to visit again, so we hopefully can arrange that uh, in due course. He's done a wonderful job in um, bringing Chesterton uh, uh, to um, uh, America, really to a, a, an international audience, so uh, has, um, is, uh, has, done, has done wonderful work. Well, uh, could I just uh, offer uh, a number of, uh, of thank yous? Um, uh, a special thank you to our speakers today uh, for all the effort that they made, uh, including Greg Sheridan, who had to leave for another commitment, um, and all, all those that are still here. To thank, thank you as the audience uh, for all of your uh, attention and, um, and participation. Um, and a number of just uh, qu quick uh, particular thank yous. Uh, first of all, to Ray Finnegan, the Society Secretary Treasurer, and to Simeon Thompson uh, and, and my wife, uh, Virginia, for uh, all the work that they've done in uh, making this conference possible. Uh, I'd especially like to thank Michael, Michael Mendieta, for um, the taping uh, today's conference papers, and as he did last year, and and arranging the acoustics as well. We're, we're very grateful to you, Michael. I, I'm particularly grateful too to, to Ivy Wallace for her artistic flair in designing the conference flyer in the first place and having to uh, rework it a number of times to send off to different publications, including uh, Annals Australasia. Um, and uh, to uh, Kessie Doherty and, um, and Gay Smith for the book sales that they've uh, had on. Uh, today. So um, uh, with that, uh, let me just uh, thank you again for, uh, for being with us and participating so fully and, um, and to, to wish you safe travelling and to uh, express the hope that we'll see you again here uh, at a future conference, which I would hope uh, will be next, next year. Thank you very much.